I remember playing Undertale before it was a big deal. Slowbeef played a little bit of it when it came out, I liked what I saw enough to buy the game on the spot, thoroughly enjoyed it, and immediately went to push it on all my friends right as it became the hip thing that everyone else was doing. And while it ended up ballooning into something as beautiful as it was frightening and annoyingly inescapable, the great things that Undertale does as a video game absolutely deserve love and praise. Every last bit of the game is so carefully considered, little details getting extra time and fleshing out, and it's this depth that's allowed the game to flourish so wonderfully. Items are all cute puns or lean into world building. Bullet patterns during fights manage to show off character personality in addition to gameplay gimmicks. And extra world building and bonus dialogue is out there in abundance for players who just can't get enough of their friends, Reverse Mermaid and Egg's Husband. It's never the hardest or most complicated RPG or bullet hell but it goes the extra mile to make sure that each encounter feels unique, meaningful, and varied. And that heart-shaped design has only grown stronger with time in the game's follow-up. As the spicier younger brother to Undertale, Deltarune takes what its predecessor set out to accomplish and turbocharges it. Basic RPG gameplay? Shazam! Expanded into a fuller and more robust combat system, with party control greatly increasing the amount of options a player has. Bullet patterns? Yeah, we got those. And now we're mixing in more variations, more combo attacks, more messing with the play area itself. Characterization and lore? Oh, we got implications stacked on top of implications, building on the previously existing mythos of Undertale, inviting players to figure out what's happened to their favorite characters without having to shove Sans back into the spotlight, while telling a wholly original story with new characters who get to develop their own worlds of self-reflection. And Birdly! All my homies hate Birdly! It's great! Deltarune succeeds so nicely at expanding Undertale's scope from a design perspective, taking those special encounters and characters that players grew to love, and finding new ways to introduce challenge, new modes, new mechanics, and then tie it all together with the friends and foes the player faces. It just makes it a joy to go through. But we have a special deal that looks beyond that and goes to leave your mom's house before you turn 30. 30. Deltarune creates a character who, in just one chapter, beautifully mixes himself in with the game in a way so thematically complete, we're practically giving it away! He integrates himself into the world around him at large, into the deeper mythos of Deltarune, and even directly into the main character, while not only remaining wildly entertaining, but having gameplay reflective of all the chaotic turmoil he stirs up. Every single action he takes, every line of dialogue is building to something, all of it reflecting a pure desperation. And it's that through line that makes Spampton G. Spampton a week. <laughs> Spampton barges into Deltarune in the middle of Chapter 2, bursting out of a dumpster while the protagonist, Chris, is alone for dog-related reasons. He addresses the audience directly, and you instantly get what this guy's about. And if you've jived with Deltarune's humor long enough to actually encounter Spamton, you probably instantly love him. His dialogue is fragmented and broken up. He speaks in all caps with funny interjections, censoring words. His name is Spamton, just to hammer in that yes, he is poking fun at spam emails and aggressive online advertising, glad you noticed. Spamton is given an entrance worthy of a sitcom guest star, made to instantly win over not necessarily the characters in the game, but the player, and doing so in a scant th th four text boxes. In short... So I hear you enjoy finding the next Tumblr sexy man. Oh, right, and Chris is there. 
Let's just put a little popular 25 piece knife package in those few lines right now. Spampton recognizes Chris as a lightener, a being known as a protector, creator, or even a god to darkeners like himself. And when faced with such a being, immediately tries to hustle them. Spampton does his best to win Chris over, seeing them alone and appealing to a presumed sense of abandonment that both of them share. How they can rise up and be big together with just this one sweet deal. And through his sales pitch, he mentions the heart-shaped heart object, object that Chris has. And despite not flinching at Spampton's impassioned sales pitch before, without any input from the player, Chris takes a step back. From the moment he's introduced, you get an idea that Spampton knows more about the world than the average character, and uses that to actively connect to the character of Chris before taking them into a battle to seal the deal. The Spampton fight is pretty e for everyone and fairly difficult to lose by design. Spampton has three attack patterns, gobbling up dollar bill signs with a vacuum mouth, spitting out tiny versions of himself that hop around the top or bottom of the screen, and spouting out hot deals that lightly track Chris's soul. While the little bouncing baby boys can be decently tricky at first, all of Spampton's attacks give you ample time to dodge, and more importantly, are very easy to graze, giving the player access to an abundance of TP. Racking up tension points is super simple with Spampton, and that's the point. He's not here to beat you, he's here to hit you with as sweet of a deal as he can offer, including giving you an action where you can heal up and negotiate with him on the same turn. Heck, he even has a unique healing mechanic where pressing F1 brings down little spam angels to heal Chris up for no money down and no time spent. Spampton wants to butter you up as much as possible while still making you feel like the one winning the fight. In order to spare Spampton, players need to navigate a brief conversation puzzle with him always seeming interested in what deals he has to offer, but not biting whenever Spampton tries to hustle them out of some <laughs> And through the course of this fight, Spampton starts unraveling more and more. He needs this deal with Chris to go through. Dialogue boxes screaming that there's nothing wrong unconvincingly, Spampton occasionally begging for help, trying to relate to Chris on how they could be so much more, how they could get big enough to not need the money and could just enjoy a little hyperlink blocked. How both of them are absolutely desperate for freedom. And then you take the deal. The entire point of Spampton's fight is to sell the idea of Spampton to the player, for him to do a little dance and be something that the player wants to pursue his charisma and general hospitality winning them over, with the little lore intrigue sprinkled in for good measure. He is actively selling you on a side quest. And if you ever seek out his shop, he's totally succeeded in his absolute crippling need for you to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so that you can see Designing 4 videos right as they... right as they come. Spampton's shop is accessed from the trash zone, and at the little man's insistence, Chris chooses to visit him alone. One on one, you get more of the same great taste you've grown to desperately try to find me again. The same winning speech pattern playing out over a glitching background, selling items that randomize in price that the player has to time correctly in order to get their big, big savings. It's fun and goofy in all the ways that you'd expect. But it's here where we get that there's a lot more that's off with Spampton. He asks you to infiltrate Queen's Mansion in order to get a, quote, heaven-piercing workout-ready body that will catapult you both to success. But he still requires that you do buy the thing from him. He can't help the hustle after all. <laughs> this would seem like an innocuous enough side quest, but then the rest of Spamton's dialogue options start swinging for the fences with references to lore-rich Deltarune characters, and we've hit the motherload of theorycrafting here. 
Spamton mentions surpassing a clown around town. And unlike him, not being content lurking in the dark, instead shooting for the skies, alluding pretty obviously to Chapter 1 super boss and chaotic basement dweller, Jevil. <laughs> When discussing the knight who creates the dark fountains keeping together Deltarune's worlds, Spamton starts freaking out, breaking his speech pattern to beg for forgiveness before bursting with anger and burying that dialogue option forever. He insists that the two of you don't need anyone else. You don't need friends. You don't need Mike. Mike? And then he breaks down, reflecting on whoever the f Mike is, before doubling down that you definitely don't need that charlatan. Keygen. Spampton is always so dangerously close to revealing key information about himself to others, but can just never bring himself to do it. That's not the sale, after all. That's not what will make him big. He doesn't need sentimentality. All he needs is your help. He needs you. Someone who can still choose. Now, you can just go to the basement, get the loaded disc, return to Spampton, and get the gravy train a-rollin'. But there are little bits of the skittish salesman littered all throughout the cyber world. You're far from the first person he's approached with this steal from the spooky basement scheme, Sweet Cap and Cakes having turned him down before. Signs of his previous success have long since eroded, Queen's image plastered right on top of him. You learn that he's tried emulating the look of Swatch, the most popular of Queen's butlers, but to no success. Even little things like an offhanded comment about how this acid bath makes you shorter add to Spampton's character through the little hints he drops. Every little detail shows Spampton having tried everything, trying to make it out on his own, trying every way he can to appeal and deal with everyone, but he just can't do it on his own. He needs to make a deal. He needs to cling to the only thing he knows how to, the only thing that's given him success before. Because nothing else has worked. I mean, I tried being a voice actor. It, it never really panned out. I really want... I, 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 this only gets confirmed when a line of Addisons appear outside of Spampton's shop. After hyperlink blocked, they reveal that Spampton was an ordinary ad guy, just like the rest of them. But he had horrible luck. Nothing he did ever seemed to go right. But oh, he had dreams to make it big. And one day, his prayers seemed to be answered. Someone partnered with him. He became rich. Everything he touched was a success. And because of that, all of his friends left him, jealous that he got to be chosen for no reason. And eventually, that luck ran out. Spampton's benefactor abandoned him, and left on his own, Spampton crashed and burned harder than he ever had before, his sales dropping to zero. He fled his room in Queen's Mansion before being evicted, leaving behind a phone in mid-call. And the only thing playing through that receiver was garbage noise, the very same that plays through Chris's own cell phone. Now, this obviously implies the presence of famous Undertale theoryman W.D. Gaster. And while that's obviously really cool, I want to applaud what it does is a compliment to Spampton's character. The way it plays out, this potential Gaster deal is practically a Faustian bargain. Spampton willing to do anything for his success. And when that inevitably comes crashing down, Spampton is desperate to pursue that again, but knows that he can't do it alone. Spampton doesn't just add to the lore of his world, he's enhanced by it, and he comes to represent all of the influencers, advertisers, and creators that there are out there. Because really, all of this could be gone tomorrow. One wrong move, one thing that slips out of your control, and you're...
just left floundering with no options. You just keep hammering away at it, keep going with tools that don't work anymore, but they worked before you got so far. They work for other people. Why? Why is it working now? You just can't stop and do something else, though. No, success could be just around the corner, just a little further away. So you just, you just keep going at it. But you, you need, you need some, just, just a little bit of help. But you don't know who. You don't know where from. So you just. After venturing into a creepy basement, surviving a teacup ride that's lethal if you're bad, downloading Spamton into a USB and sticking him inside of a forgotten robot, he ascends to his ultimate form, Spamton Neo. And finally, for both of you, it's time to be a big shot. Neo is an absolutely incredible boss fight combining all of Spamton's strong characterization with bullet patterns that are not only challenging, not only fitting, but exemplify everything that Spamton is about. The fight reintroduces the yellow soul mechanic from Undertale, turning the usual bullet-dodging jamboree into a side-view shoot-'em-up, adding in a charge move to unleash a literal beast. And Spamton gives the player plenty to fire at, shooting out little destructible versions of his face. Giant pillars of spam emails with grins to gun down and bombs to... not. Nah, delicious pepis that give birth to even more spam if they make contact. Phone face! All of Spamton's moves are made to get a ton of bullets on the screen, requiring precision shots for Chris to take and navigate through just to survive. But that's not all! Spamton can litter the screen with bullets by thrusting his achy breaky heart forward to try to connect with Chris as violently as possible, or using his full face to send out a boom, 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 of a three-pronged attack. Spamton Neo is a relentless assault of patterns, each strike becoming more powerful than the last, but none of them betray the pitiful, ever desperate shell that is Spamton's character. For every overwhelming attack that Spamton has in his arsenal, he's got a weakness that can almost totally neutralize it. If he doesn't land a hit on Chris while using his phone hand attack, it will never advance to its second, much harder pattern. The player never picking up his phone call and getting a raw deal. The spam trucks basically require Chris to graze past them in order to survive, generating a ton of TP that they can have Ralsei heal with or use to strengthen their soul for the next strike. In Spamton's big face attack, each of his eyes, nose, and mouth can be shot to death, stopping them from hurling out bullets whenever the attack is brought out again. Literally throwing your heart at someone is pretty bad for your health, and shooting it until it breaks brings Spamton ever closer to defeat. After throwing out peepees for long enough, a call will come in for Spamton to take late in the fight. The man's so desperate for a chance that he'll get hit by his own attack, giving the player a free turn. He forgot to turn his F1 toggle off so the player could have a free heal on command if they remember it from the first fight. He's completely unable to stop the player from exploiting a charge shot glitch, just getting angrier and stronger rather than actually patching the glitch out. He can't even limit your TP use like the evil clown could. I can do anything. Even at Spamton's absolute strongest, unleashing the full power of Neo, shooting out massive balls of energy representing all that his being's got to give, larger bullets deal less damage, 
and they're in a consistent, predictable pattern, making his ultimate the easiest attack to dodge in all of Spamton's arsenal. There is nothing that Spamton won't do to ascend to but every single one of his attacks gives the player an opening, or an advantage, or can blow up directly in his face. Spamton is a self-destructive, single-minded force who can't help himself from falling for the same tricks again and again and again. And this fight makes it abundantly clear just how intentional that is. Spamton Neo's performance isn't just for the sake of power, it's for the sake of attention. Constantly through the fight, it's noted that Spamton is turning to the audience, dancing for their amusement, pleading and praying for their attention. But there is no audience. The last time he had one, they were taking all the furniture out of his room, after all. He's just been performing endlessly for anyone who might want anything of what he's got. And the tiger poster. He doesn't know what else to do. He just knows that he needs that soul. So just maybe he'll have the power to do something different. Why is my body doing this thing? I'm like a puppet on a string. <laughs> but even at his lowest, Spamton still has a little bit of him wanting to fight, wanting to make a genuine connection. If you have the mannequin in the shape of Spamton or the bow tie he sold you equipped, accessories that only Chris can put on, Spamton will deal less damage to them, pulling his punches. Spamton is desperate for this win. He's desperate for a friend. He's desperate for freedom. And ultimately, you have to be the one to try to give it to him. If the player chooses to pull at the strings that bind him, cutting them down slowly, Spamton will be overjoyed when he finally notices that there's only one left. You've given him the chance to fly, given him friendship that he long since thought had abandoned him. And when he's finally ready to take off, Spamton needs the pull. He's in too deep to move without a string to yank him in the right direction. He needs Chris. He needs you. But he's too entangled to leave this pit he's been in. So he joins you as an item to remember him by. The price of his ambition and drive being the total loss of control. And that really gets to Chris. The human warrior unable to control their emotions no matter how the player chooses for them to try and internalize their feelings. And that… that's really, really good, okay? Probably implies a lot about… well, a lot of Chris's actions and inner struggle too, but that's for future chapters to tell. This right here, as its own moment, as its own little arc is good. But I got plenty more left in the tank! Spamton still has his ch 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 commemorative ring. ring alluded to if you f <laughs> him senseless in a regular run, implying the existence of an alternate, more violent chain of events that wasn't quite in Chapter 1. If you choose to follow the Snowgrave route, ordering your friend Noel to ice everyone you meet, Spamton will sell you the Thorn Ring for seven Cromer, causing Noelle intense pain to use, but allowing her to cast the lethal spells she otherwise wouldn't have access to. This causes such a disturbance that the cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. And Spamton is able to take advantage of all the turmoil to take over Queen's Mansion plastering his face all over Queens just as quickly as she was willing to cover up his mug. He's even able to bust into the basement himself, able to get everything he ever wanted. All he needed to do was strike a deal with someone who would do anything to get what they wanted. <laughs> Until Chris goes to seal the fountain, of course. What 
Chris is gonna abandon Spampton too? More likely than you think. Spampton fights with everything he has to prevent this. But since Chris has been grinding up to get some sweet new attacks, and he's still the same old puppet, Spampton can't quite liquidate the Lightner. So instead, he pulls out the old lame it out card, increasing his defense to a level that Chris can't pierce, and chipping away with weak, predictable attacks. Spampton knows he can't win on his own, but he knows you can't win alone either. And in following the Snowgrave route, Chris has managed to drive away all of his friends in the process. His calls of help being just as futile as Spampton's. The player is put in exactly the same pathetic situation Spampton is, but he's got years of desperation on you to fight with. Inevitably, he knows he's gonna win, and under his own power, until someone answers one of Chris's calls. After all, she's desperate for someone to tell her what to do. I love this stupid little guy. Spampton manages to be everything I adore about video game bosses in one incredibly lovable and incredibly mimetic package. He's got a core character that guides his every action and dialogue choice, that's reflected in his attack patterns, that helps him connect to other characters and enrich the lore behind him, and even makes a commentary on getting in too deep in your own ambitions that players can latch onto and take to heart. He's a character that'll appeal to his game's target audience incredibly well, resonates with them, and then becomes more tantalizing the more a player is willing to invest in him, all while still having a fairly challenging and memorable fight that expands upon all of the systems introduced before. We barely even touched on the guy's connection to Metaton, the irony of finding great power in the Neo framework, the deeper implications of his connection to Gaster, how he works as a reflection of Jevil, but Theory crafting isn't my strong suit, and we've got plenty on the bone here. What I find most important is how all of these possibilities can be developed. How strongly the imagination can be enraptured by a boss or character executing one specific theme so well, and how much a player can value their time with someone who's merely complementary to the story being told rather than being a player themselves. Spampton is a fabulous concept that's been examined and fleshed out to be as rewarding as possible. And getting that out of a character who literally says the word Minecraft is really something special. Spampton G. Spampton is the perfect man to design for did you know that right now you can look in our description and you will find yourself, yes, you will find yourself, our link to our Discord server, the ability to interact and mingle with nice little fellas like me. <laughs> oh, but more than that, if you wouldn't mind just giving it a little like, a little comment, a little subscribe, how about the algorithm, just, you know, give a little motion, get the gears in motion, you know, greasy wheel and all that be really helpful. And you know what? Guess what? We also have a Patreon. Yeah, that's right. You can support us so that I can eat. I really like being able to eat. Look at all these fine names all around us. Guess what? Yours can be added. Look at this name. It's a different font. You want to know how we got it? Seven dollars a month. You get to pick your own font. How is that? <laughs> what a sale. What a scoop. Deal. Just go ahead and with your old pal Spampton, find your way in! Please. Please, just... I, I, I need to be able to... I need to do this. I, um... I really like doing this, guys. Um... Thank you.